Hey folks, it's your main man Sabado. Today I'm going to go a little bit off script and, and I don't actually have a script. I just have a couple of points that I'll be referring to over here that are going to talk about something that I, I think is really important for all of us to gain some perspective around. Uh, I'm going to start this by saying that I think as human beings, one of the biggest challenges we have is we tend to underestimate the impact that we have on other people. And I, I know particularly as parents, a lot of times we think that the things that we're saying are wrong or that we're being too tough on our kids or that our kids are going to go and resent us and that we're going to somehow damage our kids. And in some cases we do. I, I, there are some parents that say some hurtful things. And I know that things have been said to me through the course of the years that at the time were very painful. But as I've matured and I look back at why those things were said, I started to realize why they were said and what they were meant to, to bring across. And sometimes it doesn't always come across. And I know I've said things to my own daughter that I probably would say differently if I had the opportunity to, but you can't go back and change the past. You can only go from the future and hope that eventually people were able to process the messages in the way that they were intended. And so today I want to talk about six statements that my father made to me that probably created some of the, uh, some of the head bumping that we had as I was growing up that as I've matured really started to make sense to me. Um, so on that note, uh, let's get into it. The first thing that my father told me was when I was really young, I was probably knee high to a grasshopper. And it tells you how far along, how far back that was because I'm six foot eight now. So if I'm knee high to a grasshopper, I was pretty young, but he said to me, everybody's not your friend. And when I was in elementary school, I've always been a a bit able to meet people. I, I don't, and I don't know if it's because I'm a physical specimen because I was bigger than everybody. I'd like to think it was because I was this cool person that everybody wanted to be around, but I, ha I had all these people around me. And so one day I was, I was talking to my father about all these friends that I made and how great it was and all these people around. And my father says to me, everybody's not your friend. And that was kind of hurtful to me at the time, because again, I had to have been in kindergarten or first grade or something like that. And so to tell a, a first grader that everybody's not your friend, it, it, it really shocks the system. But what, I, what he meant by that was is people that sometimes are in your face and that are smiling, they don't necessarily have your best intentions at, at heart. You think, about all, you think about famous people. Famous people have a lot of people around them, but it's because they think they're going to get something from it. Either it's going to get them some feel good because um, – that somebody has the opportunity to interact with a celebrity, they're going to get some money, they're going to get the hookup, there's going to be something that, that comes from it. And if you don't give them that, then all of a sudden they turn on you. And, and just to give you some perspective, my parents are from the Jim Crow South in Chattanooga, Tennessee. And so the only way that my father was able to find some success was by joining the military. And the military was the number one way at that time for a lot of black Americans to escape the South. Uh, you didn't have IBM hiring people and recruiting people nationwide to come in and go. And if they did, they certainly weren't people like us. And so uh, just a quick story about uh, how he joined the military. The military was at the basement of the post office. And so he went in to join the Marines because the Marines at the time was the easiest to get into. And he went to go talk to the recruiter. As it turns out, that recruiter was at lunch. And so the next one was the Air Force recruiter. So he joined the Air Force by the time. Long story short, by the time he retired from the military, he had done 20 years. He was a master sergeant. And I thought it was the coolest thing that he would walk around base and people would salute him. So you had people with a bunch of stripes on their uniforms, but they were saluting my dad. And this is a guy that came from the came from the Jim Crow South. And part of what he realized going through the military is there's going to be people that work against you and there's going to be people that work with you. And there's some people that are very adept at the concept of keep your friends close and your enemies closer. And so in order for people to take advantage of you, one of the things they try to do is they try to get really close to you so they can understand where your vulnerabilities are and then take advantage of that. He was telling me that probably before I could understand it, but where I was going to be able to build upon that and understand that everybody I'm around, don't just take it on face value, get to know who you're dealing with, understand the people that you're around, 
bring the good people into your circle and let the bad, let the ones that aren't out for your best interest stand on the sidelines. And, and as I look back through the course of my life, that's really served me well because I've had the opportunity to have some really good friends around me, some really good people around me. I've had a lot of people that have helped me on my journey and that continue to help me on my journey uh, because I'm able to weed out who are the people that are out for my best interest and who are the people that are just out for themselves. Uh, the second conversation I had with my dad that I, I, I recall that I thought was, was pretty interesting is when I was in high school, uh, you know, they have all these affinity groups and I call them affinity groups, but I'm going to speak of one specifically. So we had a black student union. So I told my dad, I said, you know, I, I want to join the black student union. And, and he said, why? And so I was kind of surprised. I, I said, why? Cause, cause I'm black. I, I should join the black student union to have fellowship with, with other black people. And he said, well, he says, the thing is, son, is that when you walk in a room, you're generally going to be, cause by now I'm six, three, six, four. He says, you're going to walk into a room and you're going to be the biggest person in there. And people are going to see that you're black. So it's going to be less about you being black and more about what you do. Because if you do good things, then you're going to show, number one, that black people can do it. And number two, you're going to be setting an example for somebody else that's looking for you. So if I were you, I would spend more time trying to set the example than trying to fit into a piece of to a part of a group. Because being part of a group, sometimes that separates you from other people. And then you don't take in all the perspectives that you should in order to get to where it is you want to be. And so when he said that, I said, you know, that makes sense. So I said to myself, self, I'm going to focus on being an individual because there was nothing about uh, me as an individual that was bad. There was nothing horrible. There was nothing that repelled people. And it wasn't like I had any lack of friends or people around me, but it allowed me, it gave me license to be myself. And, and what's interesting is when I got to college, I took that same idea to college where I had friends that were in a bunch of different fraternities. And each of those fraternities were trying to get me to join their fraternity to become part of them. What was interesting about that is I had friends in almost every fraternity in my college. And so I was able to go to a bunch of parties all the time. And I know it's not all about partying. And if there's any younger people on here, I apologize because I know this isn't pro politically correct, but that's not the intention. The intention, the intention is to give you some facts. And so I said to myself, why am I going to join one fraternity instead of when I have friends in all the fraternities? Because then if I become friends with if I, or I'm sorry, if I join one fraternity now, I'm in a situation where I've, I've I can't be friends because there's competitions with other fraternities and different fraternities don't like each other and so on. And that might cause me to lose some friends for a reason that's artificial. And, you know, people talk about the connections and, and things like that. But, you know, here I am now at uh you know, 52 years old. And guess what? Never joined a fraternity, never joined a black student union. I'm retired and I'm having this conversation right now in the middle of the afternoon. So I, I think there was, there was, again, there was something to that. And again, I, I, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with joining any of the groups, but if you're going to do it, don't do it to be part of the group, do it as an individual. That's going to add something to that group that maybe they don't have. But if you're using it as a way to build your own sense of who you are, then you, you, you may run the risk of, of limiting yourself because you've got to keep yourself open to different perspectives. And a lot of times those perspectives are perspectives that come from places that you wouldn't have expected or that are what I like to call unlikely sources. Another another conversation that we had that that was really impactful was uh, I used to play basketball. So when I was in high school, I played basketball and I was pretty good. I wasn't the best player on the team. I wasn't some superstar, but I was in the newspapers. People knew who I was and girls liked me. So I, I mean, what else is there to high school basketball? And I was telling my dad about all my notoriety and how I was going to be an NBA player and how great I was and how people set out all this potential. And my dad said to me one day, he said, there's only one Magic Johnson. And this is before Magic Johnson had to retire. This is when Magic Johnson was at the height of his career. And I'll tell you what, that really hurt my feelings because I thought I could be the next Magic Johnson. But the reality was it, it probably wasn't in the card because every kid that I knew was trying to be Magic Johnson. And, and that's where I learned a very valuable lesson is that at the best, I could be a second rate Magic Johnson because I'd have to emulate everything he did. But I can always be a first rate Salvador. I can always be a first rate me. 
And at that point, I realized instead of trying to follow the group, because everything up to that point said, don't try to follow the group, create your own trail. And then as you create your own trail, you could pave it however you want to and make it the best that you that you can make it. And instead of trying to be like other people, why don't you try to be somebody that other people want to be like? And, you know, I'm not I don't I don't have the kind of ego that would say that I've accomplished that. But I think that's that line of thinking has served me well, because then I was never a sheep following the flock. I was always out in the front. I was never trying to be like the Joneses. I was always Mr. Jones or at least Mr. Johnson, because I was doing something different than Mr. than Mr. Jones was. Um. One time, another another impactful conversation, and again, these are kind of all over the place, but they're going in a, in a bit of a chronological order, and I, I hope you see that, because this is helping to kind of build to, uh, I, I think, the, the, the perspective that any of you can take to get to the life that you want, and perhaps identify some of what might be holding you back as it relates to how you move in your, among other people and in your, in your social circles. So... There was a time when I worked at a YMCA and this YMCA was in in an affluent part of town and I used to have the opportunity to talk to a bunch of people. And so there was this family named the Parsagans and the Parsagans came from old money and they would give me a bunch of advice and we would have a bunch of conversations. But then there came a point where every time I said something to them, they would just start laughing. And you know, it was cool when I was telling a joke or when I was trying to be funny. But when I'm not when I'm not being funny, why are you laughing? And so I, I told my dad I was frustrated. I, you know, all the, they just keep laughing every time I say something. I'm laughing. It's like I'm a I'm a comedian or some type of entertainer, and I'm not. That's not what I'm trying to do. And and so and, and we were driving home. He had given me a, a ride home because remember when I was in college I didn't have a car, so he was giving me a ride home from work. And he said, son, if you want people to take you serious, stop telling so many jokes. And when he said that, that gave me pause. Because I, what I was realizing is the thing that I hate today is I hate the fact that people are always looking for certain people to entertain or people are always trying to get attention by being silly or being something as opposed to just being great or being themselves or doing what they do best. And because that is artificial. So once you stop telling the jokes and people stop trying to be around you, once you stop entertaining, you stop being useful to people. Just like I think there was that thing where they said, uh, I think it was in the news where the, the lady told LeBron James, shut up and dribble. And I, I thought that was incredibly offensive because LeBron James does a lot of things to help make the world a little bit better in his own way. And I'm not saying anybody's perfect. And so if anybody in the comments, uh, you know, feels different, let me know. But I just think that when you have that kind of platform, it becomes important for you to sure, maybe do the thing that you're good at, but also be able to give back and do something well and to make statements that are, that are socially accurate. And I I think that was the case in that situation as opposed to being diminished. And so from that point on, I really told myself that I was going to change how I was interacting with people because I wasn't lucky to have people interact with me. We were as mutually fortunate to be interacting with each other because most of the time in these conversations, I was bringing something to the table. And so I stopped telling the jokes. Then the question started to be, well, what's wrong? And then I told him, I'm I'm not here to entertain. I'm not here trying to be funny. Uh, There's some serious things that I said, and it kind of hurt my feelings that you didn't, um, that you just laughed at me and that, that, and they responded and they were apologetic and didn't know they were doing it and so on. And from, so from that point on, more of our conversation became more hard hitting. And anybody that knows me now knows that I go from being in a, in a jovial kind of laughing mood to being serious at the drop of a hat because I know the world has a lot of seriousness to it. And a lot of us are just laughing to keep from crying. And my job here is to try to keep as many people from crying as possible. Uh, but again, I learned that from that uh, post-conversation wrap-up with my dad after speaking to the Parsagans on multiple occasions. Um, the number five, he said, uh, I, I was talking 
about um, and it, you know I, I know some of these are controversial, and I know I'm going to probably get some some different comments from different people. But isn't that the idea? Because I really want us to start thinking about things. I think one of the challenges that we have as a as a as a Americans is that we listen so much to. Uh, others opinions and we don't formulate our own thought and so I think if we stimulate thought and even if that thought makes us angry what it does at least gets us talking about it because I would love to have some of these conversations with you about just the world in general and how people interact in general and how my interactions went in general Um, and I think it's it's for everybody so one of the conversations that we had when I was in college and this was this was really really a big deal and this fundamentally helped me move through the ranks in my professional circles and eventually become the chief functional officer for um or chief hr officer for for an organization so when i was in college this was around the time that i started learning about a lot of the the black history stuff and understanding historic uh, historically accurate information about the plight of African American people over time. Um, I was learning about things like redlining. I was learning what happened after slavery. I learned about what happened to black Americans after reconstruction. I learned about black wall street. I was learning about what was going on with, um, the, in the West Indies. I was learning all of these historically accurate pieces of information that were incredibly important. And so the first thing I did, like anybody else would do, is I got angry. Um, And I think anybody would get angry when they look back at how they've been oppressed historically. And so I was like, you know what, let's go out and let's burn everything down. Let's go kick everybody's ass and let's go kill everybody. Right. It was it was that type of vitriol that I was I was thinking. And so my dad says to me one time, he says, you know, son, do you know where Malcolm X would be if he were alive today? And so I said, you know, well, I don't know. Where do you think it would be? He says, well, I'll tell you where he wouldn't be. He wouldn't be working at IBM. And at the time, just to give some perspective, IBM was one of the largest employers in town. I said, why not? He said, because if you, if, if you, if you scare people, then you're always going to be fighting from the outside and people are going to dismiss you. Because if, if you're going in talking some of the stuff that he was talking in a way that he was. And again, I'm just saying, I'm not saying that Malcolm X was wrong, but I'm just saying if you take that in contrast to the message of Martin Luther King, who was a nonviolent man of peace, as opposed to, um, you know, the, the stereotypical, um, by all means necessary and, and, and all of those things. He says, if you want to make change, which you, if you want to make change to the system and you're on the outside of the system, it's going to be incredibly difficult because it's easy to lock the door and leave you on the outside. But if you want to make change, you have to get inside of the system and make change within the system. And in order to get inside of that system, you have to know how to read. You have to know how to write and you have to know how to speak. So in other words, you have to be able to communicate in a way that other people can understand. And then at that point, you can bring change to the system. And I thought to myself, that makes a lot of sense because if somebody's coming to beat me up or somebody's scaring me or somebody's yelling at me or somebody's creating a lack of peace in my existence, then what am I going to do? I'm going to leave them outside. I'm not going to open the door and say, come in and yell at me in my house. I'm going to close the door so they go outside. That's exactly what he was saying. And so at that point, I realized that I'm going to try to model my career in such a way that I'm able to be on the inside where decisions are actually being made. And so I was able to work my career in such a way to where I was eventually on the inside. And so there's a lot of conversations that people have in organizations that people on the outside of organizations don't have. I have a lot of people tell me, well, yeah, I've, I've been in those conversations. I've been in that conversation. I say, you may have been in a conversation, but when you're trying to make the decision on how to deal with things on a broad level that have a broad impact, uh, there are very few people in those conversations because I'm in those conversations in the organizations that I was in. And particularly as it looks at things like hiring, as it looks at 
how disciplinary actions are handed out. All the things you read about in the news, and I know there's going to be some reaction to this because you're going to say, well, you shouldn't do this, and why do people just do that? But I'm not here to litigate that. But what I am here to say is that there are people that have been historically disenfranchised over time, particularly in housing, particularly in employment. And so part of the way that you do that, and again, I go into the... um, I go into some of the social issues we deal with today. Uh, How do you have a group of male legislators telling a woman what to do with her body? I think it's asinine because as soon as that happened, there were all these questions that came up. And then people say, oh, we can't. What about, oh, we didn't think of that. Of course you didn't think about it because you don't experience that. And so part of what I was able to do was get into the system so that way I could use my experience to help bring about Uh, changes and to bring about conversations and to at least bring the perspective of how other people look. And so, you know, when you talk about things like I know the big political thing now, and again, I'm not being political, but people, people talk about DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And the way that I frame it up is diversity is changing the color of the paint on the walls. Equity is just creating fairness so people aren't being treated unfairly because of factors they can't control, like the color of their skin or their gender. And inclusion is actually taking those ideas and leveraging and using those ideas that are coming from different people. And so, I, I you know, I know what we have a tendency to do is we have a tendency to put a a, a, a bucket around something and then use it to politicize. And, I, you know, I think that's all horse crap, but it's the, it's the world that we live in. And so instead of being compartmentalized and pushed to the outside, let me make sure that my voice is heard on the inside. And and so if you want to make that change to the system, you have to do it from the inside. And we're all part of different systems. Some of us are in business. Some of us are in business for ourselves. And we have we're able to discern which customers we go to. Some of us are in real estate so we could figure out which homes are being rented to, so on and so forth. But it 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 helps you really get to the root of what the issue is because you may bring in a perspective or have access to information that helps you understand a a different perspective that helps you come up with a well-rounded solution that's not being second guessed once it's implemented because i do believe that most people are making decisions that they believe are in the best interest of everybody but if you don't get perspectives from a lot of different people then you're not necessarily doing anything for the most uh for the critical mass as as we can call it um and then the Last one I want to go back into, and we talked a little bit about it just a second ago, is that in order to make change, you have to be able to read, you have to be able to write, and you have to be able to speak the language. The first thing that people do when you speak to them is they start to size you up. What's your level of education? Where are you from? What is it that you're trying to say? Are you able to put together a phrase to get uh, appropriately? There's just a whole bunch of a whole bunch of things, and unfortunately. Uh, because people are judged in such a way, you have to present yourself the right way. And I'm not saying you have to be somebody you're not. And I'm not saying that you can't keep it real, but understand that you're dealing, everything that you're dealing with in life is within a context. And, uh, you know, my mother, you know, I give my mom props too. So it's, it's not all about the, uh, it's not all about the, the, the father love here, but it's my mother too. One of the things she says, you know, look the part. Um, you know, I was looking at this, uh, I was reading an article about a young lady who wore shorts to an interview and they told her that that wasn't appropriate for an interview. And so she decides to write it to the newspaper. But I, I think most of us would say we don't generally wear shorts to an interview. It's it's just not in a, in a professional environment. It's just not the way things are done in, in a professional environment. And so instead of getting angry, understand that you had the opportunity to be told something directly as opposed to somebody talking about you behind your back and just not giving you the job. So at least you know what the issue was so that way you have the opportunity to correct it. Part of the reason that I I wanted to share these with you is because I I know, and, and the reason I focus on my father specifically is because a lot of us don't have fathers in our lives, uh, particularly black men, uh, and again, I can't speak for everybody else. I could just speak for, for what I know and, and you know, for, for p- the people that look like me and that I represent, although I had a father in the house, it's, it's really important to understand that it's easy to look at somebody and say, you know, this person did this and they're just a bad person. But at the end of the day, um, there's going to be different messages that come from different people and you never want to 
take that, uh, take anybody's perspective and just summarily dismiss it. The other thing I think is, is critically important is the importance of being an individual. If somebody were to ask me what the singular most important characteristic uh, for me being able to get to where I am is that I don't run with the group. I don't follow others. I, I'd like to say that all my friends and the people I spend time with and that I've gotten to know over time, we're all misfits. You know, there were always the cool kids. If you if you go back and you look at your days when you were partying, when you were hanging out, there's always the cool kids. And the cool kids always have the same thing. They have the, the cool car. They have the cool clothes. They might be flashing money. But on the back end, they might be, uh, I don't know, living at their parents' house, working, a, working three minimum wage jobs struggling with everything else in their life, but they do everything to make it, to make it look good because that group wants to show you what they have as opposed to, as they, as I like to say, don't talk about it, be about it. They like to, to show and they like to, to talk about things. And so I think whenever we feel that pressure to be part of the group, I think my father was trying to instill in me a fact of individualism, be yourself, be your authentic self. Don't try to follow the group. And if the group follows you, fine, but make sure that you're setting an example. And I think that one of my favorite athletes of all time is Shaquille O'Neal. And I think he was a dominant basketball player. I mean, he was an incredible hoops player, but I'm not really impressed with who he is when he was playing hoop. I mean, yeah, he was good, but there are a lot of good players all the time. But who he is is a human being. And I think that when you look at somebody like Shaquille O'Neal, uh, Shaq's whole thing is I want to be somebody that your kids can look up to and want to be like, and I'm in, has Shaq made some mistakes? 100%. But I think Shaq is also going, looking back and trying to atone for those mistakes and recognize that he makes those mistakes and that he's not perfect. So again, I think the question that we have to ask ourselves is looking at all of our mistakes and folks, I will tell you. I have made a bunch of mistakes. I'm not perfect. And there's some things I wish I could have done differently, but, and that had a real impact on people, but I can't do that now. But I look back and I realize that, and I'm honest with myself about that. And I do what I can to make sure that those things don't ever happen again. And I think we all have that responsibility. And if we're living our lives in a way that we're comfortable, that kids can take our example and be like us when they grow up, that we'd be okay with that, then I think you're doing pretty good. So that's the message. Um, you know, I, I wanted to tell you what some of the things my father told me, and I, I wanted to also share with you some of the tremendous impact that each of you have, not just with your kids, but with the people that you have the opportunity to, to interact with and the privilege to interact with and not to take that for granted. Cause I know I did for a lot of years and I'm, I'm not going to say I'm paying the price, but I know that there was an impact on, on different people because of that. So, uh, on that note, uh, if you, if you like the video, if you think it's helpful, uh, I, I put up content a couple of times a week and you could see a bunch of videos with just down to earth perspective on real things. Most of them aren't as unscripted as this, but I thought this be, would be an important piece of information for each of us to have as we continue to try to build our perspectives to really live our best life. Because again, retirement isn't for everybody, but living our best life is. So on that note, uh, have a good rest of your day and I will talk to you soon.